Section Zero of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrion. Preliminary note by the translator. It has often been remarked with perfect justice that the eminent French writers, a translation of one of whose works is here attempted, are singularly faithful in their adherence to historic truth. Remove the thread of obvious fiction, which is indispensable to make these admirable productions romances or tales, and what we have left is perfectly reliable history. It is this feature mainly which gives the indescribable charm to their historical tales a charm powerfully realized in the original, though less appreciable in an imperfect translation. The same claim to perfect truthfulness in all essential points may be placed to the credit of the following Roman populaire, notwithstanding the startling supernatural element on which the story is founded. Erkman Chatrion have not thought it right or necessary to depart in this case from their practice of abstaining from all prefaces or notes in every edition of their works. Yet perhaps the translator may be forgiven, and even condoned with thanks, if he ventures upon an explanation tending to show that the tale of Hugh the Wolf is not entirely founded upon superstition and the supernatural. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him such was the sentence pronounced and executed upon him of babylon whose pride called for abasement from the lord dr mead observes that there was known among the ancients a mental disorder called lycanthropy the victims of which fancied themselves wolves and went about howling and attacking and tearing sheep and young children so again virgil tells of the daughters of Pretus, who fancied themselves to be cows and running wildly about the pastures implarent falsus mugitibus argos this horrible disease appears happily to have been a rare one and recoveries from it have taken place for it is not destructive of the sufferer's life it has even been thoroughly cured after a lapse of many years dr pusey in a disquisition of great fullness upon the disease of nebuchadnezzar refers to a communication which he received from dr brown a commissioner of the board of lunacy for scotland in which he says my opinion is that in all mental powers or conditions the idea of personal identity is but rarely enfeebled and that it is never extinguished the ego and non-ego may be confused the ego however continues to preserve the personality all the angels devils dukes lords kings gods many that i have had under my care remained what they were before they became angels dukes etc in a sense and even nominally i have seen a man declaring himself the savior or saint paul sign himself james thompson and attend worship as regularly as if the notion of divinity had never entered into his head Esquirol, a very trustworthy writer has a description of an extraordinary outbreak of lycanthropy in France, in the Jura, at Dole, and other places in eastern France, in the 16th century. This terrible affliction began to manifest itself in France in the 15th century, and the name of Lou Garot has been given to the sufferers. These unhappy beings fly from the society of mankind and live in the woods, the cemeteries, or old ruins, prowling about the open country only by night, howling as they go. They let their beard and nails grow, and then seeing themselves armed with claws and covered with shaggy hair, they become confirmed in the belief that they are wolves. Impelled by ferocity or want, they throw themselves upon young children, and tear, kill, and devour them. Those whom the French called Lugerot were in German termed werewolves. It may be observed on this that when the nails of the fingers and toes are cut, they grow indefinitely, but if they are allowed to grow unchecked, they soon curve over the extremities, 
form talons or claws and cease to grow answering to the scriptural account of the effects of the mental disorder of nebuchadnezzar of course for every case of real malady many were imputed or charged upon poor creatures who were driven to madness by groundless charges of witchcraft and sorcery and being loup garou in secret many innocent people were in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries burnt at the stake as wolves in human form a correspondent has kindly supplied the following information when in oud in india twenty-six years ago we heard of several instances of native babies being carried off out of the villages by she-wolves and placed with their whelps and brought up wild there there was one about when we were there partially reclaimed but retaining much of the savage nature imbibed with the wolf's milk and having been accustomed to go on all fours i e knees and elbows but i conclude these were not affected with lycanthropy with a few touches of his magic pencil the laureate has drawn a powerful picture of such a state of things in ancient britain of which we can scarcely deny the literal faithfulness it is not a poetic conception it is historic truth and ever and anon the wolf would steal the children and devour but now and then her own brood lost or dead lent her fierce teat to human sucklings and the children housed in her foul den there at their meat would growl and mock their foster mother on four feet till straightened they grew up to wolf-like men worse than the wolves coming of arthur the following tale in which the lycanthropy is far from being altogether a mere effort of the imagination appears to be founded upon the belief in the continued existence of this rare species of madness down to our own day or near it for the story seems to belong to the year eighteen thirty two the english reader will not fail to notice the correspondence between the title and the well-known designation of the illustrious head of the noble house of gravner whatever connection there may or may not be between that german hugh lupus of a thousand years ago and the truly british hugh lupus of our day all the base qualities of his supposed progenitor have disappeared in him who is adorned with all the qualities which make the english nobility rank as the pride and the flower of our land f a m the vicarage broughton in furness end of section zero recording by james k white chula vista chapter one of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sophie Owen The Man-Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrian About Christmas time in the year 18 dash, as I was lying fast asleep at the Signy at Fribourg, my old friend Gideon Sperver broke abruptly into my room, crying, Fritz, I have good news for you. I am going to take you to Nideck, two leagues from this place. You know Nideck, the finest baronial castle in the country, a grand monument of the glory of our forefathers. Now, I had not seen Sperver, who was my foster father, for sixteen years. He had grown a full beard in that time, a huge fox-skin cap covered his head, and he was holding his lantern close under my nose. It was, therefore, only natural that I should answer, In the first place, let us do things in order. Tell me who you are. Who I am? What? Don't you remember Gideon Sperver? the schwarzwald huntsman you would not be so ungrateful would you was it not i who taught you to set a trap to lay wait for the foxes along the skirts of the woods to start the dogs after the wild birds do you remember me now look at my left ear with a frostbite now i know you that left ear of yours has done it shake hands sperver passing the back of his hand across his eyes went on you know nideck of course i do by reputation what have you to do there i am the count's chief huntsman and who has sent you the young countess odile very good how soon are we to start this moment the matter is urgent the old count is very ill 
and his daughter has begged me not to lose a moment. The horses are quite ready. But Gideon, my dear fellow, just look out at the weather. It has been snowing three days without cessation. Oh, nonsense, we're not going out boar hunting. Put on your thick coat, buckle on your spurs, and let us prepare to start. I will order something to eat first. And he went out, first adding, Be sure to put on your cape. I could never refuse old Gideon anything. From my childhood he could do anything with me, with a nod or a sign. So I equipped myself and came into the coffee room. I knew, he said, that you would not let me go back without you. Eat every bit of this slice of ham, and let us drink a stirrup cup, for the horses are getting impatient. I have had your portmanteau put in. My portmanteau? What is that for? Yes, it will be all right. You will have to stay a few days at Nideck, that is indispensable, and I will tell you why presently. So we went down into the courtyard. At that moment two horsemen arrived, evidently tired out with riding, their horses in a perfect lather of foam. Sperver, who had always been a great admirer of a fine horse, expressed his surprise and admiration at these splendid animals. What beauties! They're of the Wallachian breed, I can see, as finely formed as deer and as swift. Nicholas, throw a cloth over them quickly, or they will take cold. The travellers, muffled in Siberian furs, passed close by us just as we were going to mount. I could only discern the long brown moustache of one and his singularly bright and sparkling eyes. They entered the hotel. The groom was holding our horses by the bridle. He wished us bon voyage, removed his hand, and we were off. Sperver rode a pure Mecklenburg. I was mounted on a stout cob bred in the Ardennes, full of fire. We flew over the snowy ground. In ten minutes we had left Fribourg behind us. The sky was beginning to clear up. As far as the eye could reach, we could distinguish neither road, path, nor track. Our only company were the ravens of the Black Forest, spreading their hollow wings wide over the banks of snow, trying one place after another unsuccessfully for food, and croaking, Misery! Misery! Gideon, with his weather-beaten countenance, his fur cloak and cap, galloped on ahead, whistling airs from the Freyschutz. Sometimes, as he turned, I could see the sparkling drops of moisture hanging from his long moustache. "'Well, Fritz, my boy, this is a fine winter's morning.' "'So it is, but it is rather severe, don't you think so?' "'I am fond of a clear, hard frost,' he replied. "'It promotes circulation. "'If our old minister Tobias had but the courage to start out in weather like this, "'he would soon put an end to his rheumatic pains.' "'I smiled, I am afraid, involuntarily. "'After an hour of this rapid pace, Sperver slackened his speed and let me come abreast of him. "'Fritz, I shall have to tell you the object of this journey at some time, I suppose.' I was beginning to think I ought to know what I am going about. A good many doctors have already been consulted. Indeed? Yes. Some came from Berlin in great wigs who only asked to see the patient's tongue. Others from Switzerland examined him another way. The doctors from Paris stared at their patient through magnifying glasses to learn something from his physiognomy. But all their learning was wasted, and they got large fees in reward of their ignorance. Is that the way you speak of us medical gentlemen? I am not alluding to you at all. I have too much respect for you. And if I should happen to break my leg, I don't know that there is another that I should refer to yourself to treat me as a patient. But you have not discovered an optical instrument yet to tell us what is going on inside of us. How do you know that? At this reply, the worthy fellow looked at me doubtfully, as if he thought me a quack like the rest. Yet he replied, Well, Fritz, if you have indeed such a glass, it will be wanted now. But the Count's complaint is internal. It is a terrible kind of illness, something like madness. You know that madness shows itself in either nine hours, nine days, or nine weeks. So it is said, but not having noticed this myself, I cannot say that it is so. Still, you know there are agues which return at periods of either three, six, or nine years. There are singular works in this machinery of ours. Whenever this human clockwork is wound up in some particular way, fever or indigestion or toothache returns at the very hour and day. Why, Gideon, I am quite aware of that. Those periodical complaints are the greatest trouble we have. I am sorry to hear it, for the Count's complaint is periodical. It comes back every year, on the same day, at the same hour. His mouth runs over with foam. His eyes stand out white and staring like great billiard balls. He shakes from head to foot, and he gnashes with his teeth. Perhaps this man has had serious troubles to go through. No, he has not. If his daughter would but consent to be married, he would be the happiest man alive. He is rich and powerful and full of honours. He possesses everything that the rest of the world is coveting. Unfortunately, his daughter persists in refusing every offer of marriage. 
She consecrates her life to God, and it harasses him to think that the ancient house of Nidek will become extinct. How did his illness come on? I asked. Suddenly, ten years ago, was the reply. All at once the honest fellow seemed to be recollecting himself. He took from his pocket a short pipe, filled it, and, having lighted it, one evening, said he, I was sitting alone with the Count in the armoury of the castle. It was about Christmas time. We had been hunting wild boars the whole day in the valleys of the Rathol, and had returned at night, bringing home with us two of our boarhounds ripped open from head to tail. It was just as cold as it is tonight, with snow and frost. The Count was pacing up and down the room with his chin upon his breast and his hands crossed behind him, like a man in profound thought. From time to time he stopped to watch the gathering snow on the high windows, and I was warming myself in the chimney corner, bewailing my dead hounds, and bestowing maledictions on all the wild boars that infest the Schwarzwald. Everybody at Nideck had been asleep a couple of hours, and not a sound could be heard but the tread and the clank of the Count's heavy spurred boots upon the flags. I remember well that a crow, no doubt driven by a gust of wind, came flapping its wings against the window panes, uttering a discordant shriek, and how the sheets of snow fell from the windows, and the windows suddenly changed from white to black. But what has all this to do with your master's illness? I interrupted. Let me go on, you will soon see. At that cry the Count suddenly gathered himself together with a shuddering movement. His eyes became fixed with a glassy stare, his cheeks were bloodless, and he bent his head forward, just like a hunter catching the sound of his approaching game. I went on warming myself, and I thought, won't he soon go to bed now? Before to tell you the truth, I was overcome with fatigue. All these details, Fritz, are still present in my memory. Scarcely had the bird of ill omen croaked its unearthly cry when the old clock struck eleven. At that moment, the Count turns on his heel. He listens. His lips tremble. I can see him staggering like a drunken man. He stretches out his hands. His jaws are tightly clenched, his eyes staring and white. I cried, My lord, what is the matter? But he began to laugh discordantly like a madman, stumbled and fell upon the stone floor, face downwards. I called for help. Servants came round. Sebalt took the Count by the shoulders. We removed him to a bed near the window. But just as I was loosening the Count's neckerchief, for I was afraid it was apoplexy, the Countess came and flung herself upon the body of her father, uttering such heart-rending cries that the very remembrance of them makes me shudder. Here Gideon took his pipe from his lips, knocked the ashes out onto the pommel of his saddle, and pursued his tale in a saddened voice. From that day, Fritz, nothing but evil days have come upon Nideck and better times seem to be far off. Every year, at the same day and hour, the Count has shuddering fits. The malady lasts from a week to a fortnight, during which she howls and yells so frightfully that it makes a man's blood run cold to hear him. Then he slowly recovers his usual health. He is still pale and weak, and moves trembling from one chair to another, starting at the least noise or movement, and fearful of his own shadow. The young Countess, the sweetest creature in the world, never leaves his side, but he cannot endure her while the fit is upon him. He roars at her, Go, leave me this moment. I have enough to endure without seeing you hanging about me. It is a horrible sight. I am always close at his heels in the chase, I who sound the horn when he has killed the forest beasts. I am at the head of all his retainers, and I would give my life for his sake. Yet when he is at his worst, I can hardly keep my hands from his throat. I am so horrified at the way in which he treats his beautiful daughter. Spurfer looked dangerously wroth for a moment, clapped both his spurs to his mount, and we rode on at a hard gallop. I had fallen into a reverie. The cure of a complaint of this description appeared to me more than doubtful, even impossible. It was evidently a mental disorder. To fight against it with any hope of success, it would be needful to trace it back to its origin, and this would, no doubt, be too remote for successful investigation. All these reflections perplexed me greatly. The old huntsman's story, far from strengthening my hopes, only depressed me. Not a very favourable condition to ensure success. At about three we came in sight of the ancient castle of Nideck, on the verge of the horizon. In spite of the great distance we could distinguish the projecting turrets, apparently suspended from the angles of the edifice. It was but a dim outline barely distinguishable from the blue sky, but soon the red points of the Vosges became visible. At that moment Spurvo drew in his bridle and said, Fritz, we shall have to get there before night. Onward! But it was in vain that he spurred and lashed. 
The horse stood rooted to the ground, his ears thrown back, his nostrils dilated, his sides panting, his legs firmly planted in an attitude of resistance. "'What is the matter with the beast?' cried Gideon in astonishment. "'Do you see anything, Fritz? Surely!' He broke off abruptly, pointing with his whip at a dark form in the snow fifty yards off on the slope of the hill. "'The Black Plague!' he exclaimed, with a voice of distress which almost robbed me of my self-possession. Following the indication of his outstretched whip, I discerned with astonishment an aged woman crouching on the snowy ground, with her arms clasped about her knees, and so tattered that her red elbows came through her tattered sleeves. A few ragged locks of grey hung about her long, scraggy, red and vulture-like neck. Strange to say, a bundle of some kind lay upon her knees, and her haggard eyes were directed upon distant objects in the white landscape. Spencer drew off to the left, giving the hideous object as wide a berth as he could, and I had some difficulty in following him. Now, I cried, what is all this for? Are you joking? Joking? Assuredly not. I never joke about such serious matters. I am not given to superstition, but I confess that I am alarmed at this meeting. Then turning his head, and noticing that the old woman had not moved, and that her eyes were fixed upon the same one spot, he appeared to gather a little courage. Fritz, he said solemnly, you are a man of learning. You know many things of which I know nothing at all. Well, I can tell you this, that a man is in the wrong who laughs at a thing because he can't understand it. I have good reasons for calling this woman the Black Plague. She is known by that name in the whole Black Forest, but here at Nideck she has earned that title by supreme right. And the good man pursued his way without further observation. Now, Sperver, just explain what you mean, I asked, for I don't understand you. That woman is the ruin of us all. She is a witch. She is the cause of it all. It is she who is killing the Count by inches. How is that possible? I exclaimed. How could she exercise such a baneful influence? I cannot tell how it is. All I know is that on the very day that the attack comes on, at the very moment, if you will ascend the Beacon Tower, you will see the Black Plague squatting down like a dark speck on the snow just between the Tiefenbach and the Castle of Nideck. She sits there alone, crouching close to the snow. Every day she comes a little nearer, and every day the attacks grow worse. You would think he hears her approach. Sometimes, on the first day, when the fits of trembling have come over him, he has said to me, Gideon, I feel her coming. I hold him by the arms and restrain the shuddering somewhat, but he still repeats, stammering and struggling with his agony, and his eyes staring and fixed. She is coming. Nearer. Oh, oh, she comes. Then I go up Hugh Lufus's tower. I survey the country. You know I have a keen eye for distant objects. At last, amidst the grey mists afar off, between sky and earth, I can just make out a dark speck. The next morning that black spot has grown larger. The Count of Nideck goes to bed with chattering teeth. The next day after we can make out the figure of the old hag. The fierce attacks begin. The Count cries out, the day after, the witch is at the foot of the mountain, and the consequence is that the Count's jaws are set like a vice, his mouth foams, his eyes turn in his head. Vile creature! Twenty times I have had her within gunshot, and the Count has bid me shed no blood. No, Sperver, no, let us have no bloodshed. Poor man! He is sparing the life of the wretch who is draining his life from him, for she is killing him, Fritz, he is reduced to skin and bone. My good friend Gideon was in too great a rage with the unhappy woman to make it possible to bring him back to calm reason. Besides, who can draw the limits around the region of possibility? Every day we see the range of reality extending more widely. Unseen and unknown influences, marvellous correspondences, invisible bonds, some kind of mysterious magnetism, are, on the one hand, proclaimed as undoubted facts, and denied, on the other, with irony and scepticism. And yet who can say that after a while there will not be some astonishing revelations breaking in the midst of us all when we least expect it? In the midst of so much ignorance it seems easy to lay a claim to wisdom and shrewdness. I therefore only begged Sperver to moderate his anger, and by no means to fire upon the Black Plague, warning him that such a proceeding would bring serious misfortune upon him. Puh! he cried. At the very worst they could but hang me. But that, I remarked, was a good deal for an honest man to suffer. "'Not at all!' he cried. "'It is but one death out of many. "'You are suffocated, that is all. 
I would just as soon die of that as of a hammer falling on my head, as in apoplexy, or not be able to sleep, or smoke, or swallow, or digest my food. You, Gideon, with your grey beard, you have learnt a peculiar mode of reasoning. Grey beard or not, that is my way of seeing things. I always keep a ball in my double-barrelled gun at the witch's service. From time to time I put in a fresh charge, and if I get the chance... He only added an expressive gesture. Quite wrong, Sperver, quite wrong. I agree with the Count of Nideck, and I say no bloodshed. Oceans cannot wipe away bloodshed and anger. Think of that, and discharge that barrel against the first boar you meet. These words seemed to make some impression upon the old huntsman. He hung down his head and looked thoughtful. We were then climbing the wooded steeps which separate the poor village of Tiefenbach from the castle of Nideck. Night had closed in. As it always happens with us after our bright, clear winter's day, snow was again beginning to fall. Heavy flakes dropped and melted upon our horses' manes, who were beginning now to pluck up their spirits at the near prospect of the comfortable stable. Now and then Sperver looked over his shoulder with evident uneasiness, and I myself was not altogether free from a feeling of apprehension in thinking of the strange account which the huntsman had given me of his master's complaint. Besides all this, there is a certain harmony between external nature and the spirit of a man, and I know of nothing more depressing than a gloomy forest loaded in every branch with thick snow and hoar frost, and moaning in the north wind. The gaunt and weird-looking trunks of the tall pines and the gnarled and massive oaks look mournfully upon you, and fill you with melancholy thoughts. As we ascended the rocky eminence, the oaks became fewer, and scattered birches, straight and white as marble pillars, divided the dark green of the forest pines, when in a moment, as we issued from a thicket, the ancient stronghold stood before us in a heavy mass, its dark surface studded with brilliant points of light. Sperver had pulled up before a deep gateway between two towers, barred in by an iron grating. "'Here we are!' he cried, throwing the reins on the horses' necks. He laid hold of the deer's foot bell handle, and the clear sound of a bell broke the stillness. After waiting a few minutes, the light of a lantern flickered in the deep archway, showing us in its semicircular frame of ruddy light the figure of a humpbacked dwarf, yellow-bearded, broad-shouldered, and wrapped in furs from head to foot. You might have thought him in the deep shadow some gnome or evil spirit of earth realised out of the dreams of the Nibelungen leader. He came towards us at a very leisurely pace, and laid his great flat features close against the massive grating, straining his eyes and trying to make us out in the darkness in which we were standing. "'Is that you, Sperver?' he asked in a hoarse voice. "'Open at once, Knapwurst,' was the quick reply. "'Don't you know how cold it is?' "'Oh, I know you now,' cried the little man. "'There's no mistaking you. "'You always speak as if you were going to gobble people up.' "'The door opened, and the dwarf, examining me with his lantern, "'with an odd expression in his face, received me with, "'Welcome in, Herr Doctor?' "'But which seemed to say besides, "'Here is another who will have to go away again, as others have done.' "'Then he quietly closed the door, whilst we alighted, "'and came to take our horses by the bridle.' End of chapter one. Recording by Sophie Owen. Chapter two of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrian. Chapter 2 Following Sperver, who ascended the staircase with rapid steps, I was still able to convince myself that the castle of Nidic had not an undeserved reputation. It was a true stronghold, partly cut out of the rock, such as used formerly to be called a Chateau d'Ambuscade. Its lofty vaulted arches re-echoed afar with our steps and the outside air blowing with sharp gusts through the loopholes, narrow slits made for the archers of former days, caused our torches to flare and flicker from space to space over the faintly illuminated protruding lines of the arches as they caught the uncertain light. Sperver knew every nook and corner of this vast place. He turned now to the right and now to the left, and I followed him breathless. 
at last he stopped on a spacious landing and said to me now fritz i will leave you for a minute with the people of the castle to inform the young countess odile of your arrival do just what you think right then you will find the head butler tobias offenlock an old soldier of the regiment of nidick he campaigned in france under the count and you will see his wife a frenchwoman marie lagoutte who pretends that she comes of a high family and why should she not of course she might but between ourselves she was nothing but a contenir in the grande armee she brought in tobias offenlock upon her cart with one of his legs gone and he has married her out of gratitude you understand that will do but open for i'm numb with cold and i was about to push on but sperver as obstinate as any other good german was not going to let me off without edifying me upon the history of the people with whom my lot was going to be cast for a while and holding me by the frogs of my fur coat he went on there's besides sebalt craft the master of the hounds he is rather a dismal fellow but he is not his equal at sounding the horn and there will be karl trump the butler and christian becker and everybody unless they have all gone to bed thereupon sperver pushed open the door and i stood in some surprise on the threshold of a high dark hall the guard-room of the old lords of nidick my eyes fell at first upon the three windows at the farther end looking out upon the sheer rocky precipice on the right stood an old sideboard in dark oak and upon it a cask glasses and bottles on the left a gothic chimney overhung with its heavy massive mantelpiece empurpled by the brilliant roaring fire underneath and ornamented on both front and sides with wood carvings representing scenes from boar hunts in the middle ages and along the centre of the apartment a long table upon which stood a huge lamp throwing its light upon a dozen pewter tankards at one glance i saw all this but the human portion of the scene interested me most i recognized the major-domo or head butler by his wooden leg of which i had already heard he was of low stature round fat and rosy and his knees seldom coming within an easy range of his eyesight a nose red and bulbous like a ripe raspberry on his head he wore a huge hemp-coloured wig bulging out over his fat poll a coat of light green plush with steel buttons as large as a five-franc piece velvet breeches silk stockings and shoes garnished with silver buckles he was just with his hand upon the top of the cask with an air of inexpressible satisfaction beaming upon his ruddy features and his eyes glowing in profile from the reflection of the fire like a couple of watch glasses his wife the worthy marie lagoutte her spare figure draped in voluminous folds her long and sallow face like a skin of chamois leather was playing at cards with two servants who were gravely seated on straight-backed armchairs certain small split pegs were seated astride across the nose of the old woman and that of another player whilst the third was significantly and cunningly winking his eye and seeming to enjoy seeing them victimized upon these new caudine forks how many cards he was asking two answered the old woman and you christian two aha uh -huh. now i've got you then cut the king now the ace here's one here's another another peg mother this will teach you once more not to brag about french games monsieur christian you don't treat the fair sex with proper respect at cards you respect nobody but you see i have no room left pooh on a nose like yours there's always room for more at that moment sperver cried mates here i am ha ah, gideon back already marie lagoutte shook off her numerous pegs with a jerk of her head the big butler drank off his glass everybody turned our way is monseigneur better the butler answered with a doubtful ejaculation is he just the same much about answered marie lagoutte who never took her eyes off me sperver noticed this 
let me introduce you to my foster son dr fritz from the black forest he answered proudly now we shall see a change master toby now that fritz has come the abominable fits will be put an end to if i had but been listened to earlier but better late than never marie lagoutte was still watching us and her scrutiny seemed satisfactory for addressing the major domo she said now monsieur offenlock hand the doctor a chair move about a little do there you stand with your mouth wide open just like a fish ah sir these germans and the good man jumping up as if moved by a spring came to take off my cloak permit me sir you are very kind my dear lady give it to me what terrible weather ah monsieur what a dreadful country this is so monseigneur is neither better nor worse said sperver shaking the snow off his cap we are not too late then ho oh, casper casper a little man who had one shoulder higher than the other and his face spotted with innumerable freckles came out of the chimney corner here i am very good now get ready for this gentleman the bedroom at the end of the long galley hugh's room you know which i mean yes sperver in a minute and you will take with you as you go the doctor's knapsack knapwurst will give it you as for supper never you mind that is my business very well then i will depend upon you the little man went out and gideon after taking off his cape left us to go and inform the young countess of my arrival i was rather overpowered with the attentions of marie lagoutte give up that place of yours sebald she cried to the kennel-keeper you are roasted enough by this time sit near the fire monsieur le docteur you must have very cold feet stretch out your legs that's the way then holding out her snuff-box to me do you take snuff no dear madam with many thanks that is a pity she answered filling both nostrils it is the most delightful habit she slipped her snuff-box back into her apron pocket and went on you are come not a bit too soon monseigneur had a second attack yesterday it was an awful attack was it not monsieur offenlock furious indeed answered the head butler gravely it is not surprising she continued when a man takes no nourishment fancy monsieur that for two days he has never tasted broth nor a glass of wine added the major-domo crossing his hands over his portly well-lined person as it seemed expected of me i expressed my surprise on which tobias offenlock came to sit at my right hand and said doctor take my advice order him a bottle a day of marco bruner and chimed in marie lagoutte a wing of a chicken at every meal the poor man is frightfully thin we have got marco bruner sixty years in a bottle added the major-domo for it is a mistake of madame offenlock's to suppose that the french drank it all and you had better order while you are about it now and then a good bottle of johannesburg that is the best wine to set a man up again time was remarked the master of the hounds in a dismal voice time was when monseigneur hunted twice a week then he was well when he left off hunting then he fell ill of course it could not be otherwise observed marie lagoutte the open air gives you an appetite the doctor had better order him to hunt three times a week to make up for lost time two would be enough replied the man of dogs with the same gravity quite enough the hounds must have their rest dogs have just as much right to rest as we have there was a few moments silence during which i could hear the wind beating against the window panes and rush sighing and wailing through the loopholes into the towers sabalt sat with legs across and his elbow resting on his knee gazing into the fire with unspeakable dolefulness marie lagoutte after having refreshed herself with a fresh pinch was settling her snuff into shape in its box while i sat thinking on the strange habit people indulge in of pressing their advice upon those who don't want it at this moment the major-domo rose will you have a glass of wine doctor 
said he, leaning over the back of my armchair. Thank you, but I never drink before seeing a patient. What? Not even one little glass? Not the smallest glass you could offer me. He opened his eyes wide and looked with astonishment at his wife. The doctor is right, she said. I am quite of his opinion. I prefer to drink with my meat and to take a glass of cognac afterwards. That is what the ladies do in France. Cognac is more fashionable than Kirschwasser. Marie Legoute had hardly finished with her dissertation when Sperver opened the door quietly and beckoned me to follow him. I bowed to the honorable company, and as I was entering the passage, I could hear that lady saying to her husband, That is a nice young man. He would have made a good-looking soldier. Sperver looked uneasy, but said nothing. I was full of my own thoughts. A few steps under the darkling vaults of Nidic, completely effaced from my memory, the queer figures of Tobias and Marie Legoute, poor harmless creatures existing like bats under the mighty wing of the vulture. Soon Gideon brought me into a sumptuous apartment hung with violet-colored velvet, relieved with gold. A bronze lamp stood in a corner, its brightness toned down by a globe of ground crystal. Thick carpets, soft as the turf on the hills, made our steps noiseless. It seemed a fit abode for silence and meditation. On entering, Sperver lifted the heavy draperies which fell around an Aji window. I observed him straining his eyes to discover something in the darkened distance. He was trying to make out whether the witch still lay there, crouching down upon the snow in the midst of the plain. But he could see nothing, for there was deep darkness over all. But I had gone on a few steps, and came in sight by the faint rays of the lamp of a pale, delicate figure seated in a gothic chair not far from the sick man. It was Odile of Nidic. Her long black silk dress, her gentle expression of calm self-devotion and complete resignation, the ideal angel-like cast of her sweet features, recalled to one's mind those mysterious creations of the pencil in the Middle Ages when painting was pursued as a true art but which modern imitators have found themselves obliged to give up in despair, while at the same time they never can forget them. I cannot say what thoughts passed rapidly through my mind at the sight of this fair creature, but certainly much of devotion mingled with my sentiments. A sense of music and harmony swept sadly through my soul with faint impressions of the old ballads of my childhood, of those pious songs with which the kind nurses of the Black Forest rock to peaceful sleep our infant sorrows. At my approach, Odile rose. You are very welcome, Monsieur le Docteur, she said with touching kindness and simplicity. Then, pointing with her finger to a recess where lay the Count, she added, There is my father. I bowed respectfully and without answering, for I felt deeply affected and drew near to my patient. Sperver, standing at the head of the bed, held up the lamp with one hand, holding his fur cap in the other. Odile stood at my left hand. The light, softened by the subdued light of the globe of ground crystal, fell softly on the face of the Count. At once I was struck with a strangeness in the physiognomy of the Count of Nidic, and in spite of all the admiration which his lovely daughter had at once obtained from me, my first conclusion was, What an old wolf! And such he seemed to be, indeed. A gray head, covered with short, close hair, strangely full behind the ears, and drawn out in the face to a portentous length. The narrowness of his forehead, up to its summit, widening over the eyebrows, which were shaggy, and met pointing downwards over the bridge of the nose, imperfectly shading with their sable outline the cold and inexpressive eyes. The short, rough beard, irregularly spread over the angular and bony outline of the mouth. Every feature of this man's dreadful countenance made me shudder, and strange notions crossed my mind about the mysterious affinities between man and the lower creation. But I resisted my first impressions and took the sick man's hand. It was dry and wiry, yet small and strong. I found the pulse quick, feverish, and denoting great irritability. What was I to do? I stood considering. On the one side stood the young lady, 
anxiously trying to read a little hope in my face on the other sperver equally anxious and watching my every movement a painful constraint lay therefore upon me yet i saw that there was nothing definite that could be attempted yet i dropped the arm and listened to the breathing from time to time a convulsive sob heaved the sick man's heart after which followed a succession of quick short respirations a kind of nightmare was evidently weighing him down epilepsy perhaps or tetanus but what could be the cause or origin i turned round full of painful thoughts is there any hope sir asked the young countess yesterday's crisis is drawing to its close i answered we must see if we can prevent its recurrence is there any possibility of it sir i was about to answer in general medical terms not daring to venture any positive assertions when the distant sound of the bell at the gate fell upon our ears visitors said sperver there was a moment's silence go and see who it is said odile whose brow was for a minute shaded with anxiety how can one be hospitable to strangers at such a time it is hardly possible but the door opened and a rosy face with golden hair appeared in the shadow and said in a whisper it is the baron of zimmer bluderich with a servant and he asks for shelter in the nidic he has lost his way among the mountains very well gretchen answered the young countess kindly go and tell the steward to attend to the baron de zimmer inform him that the count is very ill and that this alone prevents him from doing the honours as he would wish wake up some of our people to wait on him and let everything be done properly nothing could exceed the sweet and noble simplicity of the young chatelaine in giving her orders if an air of distinction seems hereditary in some families it is surely because the exercise of the duties conferred by the possession of wealth has a natural tendency to ennoble the whole character and bearing these thoughts passed through my mind whilst admiring the grace and gentleness in every movement of odile of nidic and that clearness and purity of outline which is only found marked in the features of the higher aristocracy and i could recall nothing to my recollection equal to this ideal beauty go now gretchen said the young countess and make haste the attendant went out and i stood a few seconds under the influence of the charm of her manner odile turned round and addressing me you see sir said she with a sad smile one may not indulge in grief without a pause we must divide ourselves between our affection within and the world without true madam i replied souls of the highest order are for the common property and advantage of the unhappy the lost wayfarer the sick the hungry poor each has his claim for a share for god has made them like the stars of heaven to give light and pleasure to all the deep fringed eyelids veiled the blue eyes for a moment while sperver pressed my hand presently she pursued ah if you could but restore my father's health as i have had the pleasure to inform you madam the crisis is past the return must be anticipated if possible do you hope that it may with god's help madam it is not impossible i will think carefully over it odile much moved came with me to the door sperver and i crossed the anteroom where a few servants were waiting for the orders of their mistress we had just entered the corridor when gideon who was walking first turned quickly round and placing both his hands on my shoulders said come fritz i am to be depended upon for keeping a secret what is your opinion i think there is no cause for apprehension for to-night i know that so you told the countess but how about to-morrow to-morrow yes don't turn round i suppose you cannot prevent the return of the complaint do you think fritz he will die of it it is possible but hardly probable well done cried the good man springing from the ground with joy if you don't think so that means that you are sure and taking my arm he drew me into the gallery we had just reached it when the baron of zimmer bluderich and his groom appeared there also marshalled by sebalt 
with a lighted torch in his hand they were on their way to their chambers and those two figures with their cloaks flung over their shoulders their loose hungarian boots up to the knees the body closely girt with long dark green laced and frogged tunics and the bearskin cap closely and warmly covering the head were very picturesque objects by the flickering light of the pine torch there whispered sperver if i am not very much mistaken those are our freeborg friends they have followed very close upon our heels you are quite right they are the men i recognize the younger by his tall slender figure his aquiline nose and his long drooping moustache they disappeared through a side passage gideon took a torch from the wall and guided me through quite a maze of corridors aisles narrow and wide passages under high vaulted roofs and under low built arches who could remember there seemed no end here is the hall of the margraves said he here is the portrait gallery and this is the chapel where no mass has been said since louis the bold became a protestant all these particulars had very little interest for me after reaching the end we had again to go down steps at last we happily came to the end of our journey before a low massive door sperver took a huge key out of his pocket and handing me the torch said mind the light look out at the same time he pushed open the door and the cold outside air rushed into the narrow passage the torch flared and sent out a volley of sparks in all directions I thought I saw a dark abyss before me, and recoiled with fear. Ha, 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 cried the huntsman, opening his mouth from ear to ear. You are surely not afraid, Fritz. Come on, don't be frightened. We are upon the parapet between the castle and the old tower. And my friend advanced to set me the example. The narrow granite-walled platform was deep in snow, swept in swirling banks by the angry winds. Any one who had seen our flaring torch from below would have asked, What are they doing up there in the clouds? What can they want at this time of the night? Perhaps, I thought within myself, the witch is looking up at us, and that idea gave me a fit of shuddering. I drew closer together the folds of my horseman's cloak, and with my hand upon my hat, I set off after Sperver at a run. He was raising the light above his head to show me the road, and was moving forward rapidly. We rushed into the tower, and then into Hugh Lupus's chamber. A bright fire saluted us here, with its cheerful rays. How delightful to be once more sheltered by thick walls! I had stopped while Sperver closed the door, and, contemplating this ancient abode, I cried, Thank God we shall rest now! With a well-furnished table before us, added Gideon. Don't stand there with your nose in the air but rather consider what is before you a leg of a kid a couple of roast fowls a pike fresh caught with parsley sauce cold meats and hot wines that's what i like casper has attended to my orders like a real good fellow gideon spoke the truth the meats were cold and the wines were warm for in front of the fire stood a row of small bottles under the gentle influence of the heat at the sight of these good things my appetite rose in me wonderfully but sperver who understood what is comfortable stopped me fritz said he don't let us be in too great a hurry we have plenty of time the falls won't fly away your boots must hurt you after eight hours on horseback it is pleasant to take off one's boots that's my principle now sit down put your boot between my knees there goes one off now the other that's the way now put your feet into these slippers take off your cloak and throw this lighter coat over your shoulders now we are ready and with his cheery summons i sat down with him to work one on each side of the table remembering the german proverb thirst comes from the evil one but good wine from the powers above end of chapter two recording by james k white chula vista Chapter Three of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter 3. We ate with the vigorous appetite which ten hours in the snows of the Black Forest would be sure to provoke. Sperver, making indiscriminate attacks upon the kid, the fowls, and the fish, murmured with his mouth full. The woods, the lakes, and rivers, and the heathery hills are full of good things. Then he leaned over the back of his chair, and laying his hand on the first bottle that came to hand, he added, And we have hills green in spring, purple in autumn, when the grapes ripen. Your health, Fritz. Yours, Gideon. We were a wonder to behold. We reciprocally admired each other. The fire crackled, the forks rattled, teeth were in full activity, bottles gurgled, glasses jingled, while outside the wintry blast, the high moaning mountain winds, were mournfully chanting the dirge of the year, that strange wailing hymn with which they accompany the shock of the tempest and the swift rush of the grey clouds charged with snow and hail, while the pale moon lights up the grim and ghastly battle scene. But we were snug under cover, and our appetite was fading away into history. Sperver had filled the Wiederkalm, the come again, with old wine of Brumberg. The sparkling froth fringed its ample borders. He presented it to me, saying, Drink the health of Yeri Hans, Lord of Nidic. Drink to the last drop, and show them that you mean it. Which was done. Then he filled it again, and repeating with a voice that re-echoed among the old walls, To the recovery of my noble master, the high and mighty lord of Nidic. He drained it also. Then a feeling of satisfied repletion stole gently over us, and we felt pleased with everything. I fell back in my chair with my face directed to the ceiling, and my arms hanging lazily down. I began dreamily to consider what sort of a place I had got into. It was a low vaulted ceiling cut out of the live rock, almost oven shaped, and hardly twelve feet high at the highest point. At the farther end, I saw a sort of deep recess where lay my bed on the ground, and consisting, as I thought I could see, of a huge bearskin above, and I could not tell what below. And within this, yet another smaller niche with a figure of the Virgin Mary carved out of the same granite and crowned with a bunch of withered grass. You are looking over your room, said Spencer. Parbleu, it is none of the biggest or grandest, not quite like the rooms in the castle. We are now in Hugh Lupus's tower, a place as old as the mountain itself, going as far back as the days of Charlemagne. In those days, as you see, people had not yet learned to build arches high, round, or pointed. They worked right into the rock. Well, for all that, you have put me in strange lodgings. Don't be mistaken, Fritz. It is the place of honor. It is here that the Count put all his most distinguished friends. Mind that. Hugh Lupus's tower is the most honorable accommodation we have. And who was Hugh Lupus? Why, Hugh the Wolf, to be sure. He was the head of the family of Nidic, a rough and ready warrior, I can tell you. He came to settle up here with a score of horsemen and halberdiers of his following, they climbed up this rock, the highest rock amongst these mountains. You will see this tomorrow. They constructed this tower and proclaimed, Now we are the masters. Woe befall the miserable wretches who shall pass without paying toll to us. We will tear the wool off their backs, and their hide too, if need be. From this watchtower we shall command a view of the far distance all round. The passes of the Rathal, of Steinbach, Koch Plate, and of the whole line of the Black Forest are under our eye. Let the Jew peddlers and the dealers beware. And the noble fellows did what they promised. Hugh the Wolf was at their head. Knapwurst told me all about it sitting up one night. Who is Knapwurst? That little humpback who opened the gate for us. He is an odd fellow, Fritz, and almost lives in the library. So you have a man of learning at Nidick? Yes, we have, the rascal. Instead of confining himself to the porter's lodge, his proper place, 
all the day over he is amongst the dusty books and parchments belonging to the family he comes and goes along the shelves of the library just like a big cat knapworth knows our story better than we know it ourselves he would tell you the longest tales fritz if you would only let him he calls them chronicles <laughs> and sperver with the wine mounting a little into his head began to laugh he could hardly say why so then gideon you call this tower hugh's tower the hugh lupus tower haven't i told you so already what are you so astonished at nothing particular but you are i can see it in your face you were thinking of something strange what is it oh never mind it is not the name of the tower which surprises me what i am wondering at is how it is that you an old poacher who had never lived anywhere since you were a boy but amongst the fir forests between the snowy summits of the Baldhorn and the passes of the Rathal, you who during all your prime of life thought it the finest of fun to laugh at the count's gamekeepers and to scour the mountain paths of the schwarzwald and boat the bushes there and breathe the free air and bask in the bright sunshine amongst the hills and valleys here i find you at the end of sixteen years of such a life shut up in this red granite hole that is what surprises me and what i cannot understand come sperber light your pipe and tell me all about it the old poacher took out of his leathern jacket a bit of a blackened pipe he filled it at his leisure gathered up in the hollow of his hand a live ember which he placed upon the bowl of his pipe then with his eyes dreamily cast up to the ceiling he answered meditatively old falcons gerfalcons and hawks when they have long swept the plains end their lives in a hole in a rock sure enough i am fond of the wide expanse of sky and land i always was fond of it but instead of perching by night upon a high branch of a tall tree rocked by the wind i now prefer to return to my cavern to drink a glass to pick a bone of venison and dry my plumage before a warm fire the count of nidick does not disdain sperver the old hawk the true man of the woods one evening meeting me by moonlight he frankly said to me old comrade you hunt only by night come and hunt by day with me you have a sharp beak and strong claws well hunt away if such is your nature but hunt by my license for i am the eagle upon these mountains and my name is nidick sperver was silent a few minutes then he resumed that was just what suited me and now i hunt as i used to do and i quietly drink along with a friend my bottle of Affenthal, or at that moment there was a shock that made the door vibrate sperver stopped and listened it's a gust of wind i said no it's something else don't you hear the scratching of claws it is a dog that has escaped open liberle open blitzen cried the huntsman rising but he had not gone a couple of steps when a formidable-looking hound of the danish breed broke into the tower and ran to lay his heavy paws on his master's shoulders licking his beard and his cheeks with his long rose-colored tongue uttering all the while short barks and yelps expressive of his joy sperver had passed his arm round the dog's neck and turning to me said fritz what man could love me as this dog does do look at his head these eyes these teeth he uncovered the animal's teeth displaying a set of fangs that would have pulled down and rent a buffalo then repelling him with difficulty for the dog was redoubling his caresses down Leverlay. i know you love me if you did not who would never had i seen so tremendous a dog as this Leverlay his height attained two feet and a half he would have been a most formidable creature in an attack his forehead was broad flat and covered with fine soft hair his eye was keen his paws of great length his sides and legs a woven mass of muscles and nerves broad over the back and shoulders slender and tapering towards the hind legs but he had no scent if such monstrous and powerful hounds were endowed with the scent of the terrier there would soon be an end of game 
Sperver had returned to his seat and was passing his hand over Leverlet's massive head with pride, and enumerating to me his excellent qualities. Leverlet seemed to understand him. See, Fritz, that dog will throttle a wolf with one snap of his jaws. For courage and strength, he is perfection. He is not five years old, but he is in his prime. I need not tell you that he is trained to hunt the boar. Every time we come across a herd of them, I tremble for Leverlet. His attack is too straightforward. He flies on the game as straight as an arrow. That is why I am afraid of the brute's tusks. Lie down, Leverlet. Lie on your back. The dog obeyed and presented to view his flesh-colored sides. Look, Fritz, at that long white seam without any hair upon it from under the thigh, right up to the chest. A boar did that. Poor creature. He was holding him fast by the ear and would not let go. We tracked the two by the blood. I was the first up with them. Seeing my lever lay, I gave a shout. I jumped off my horse. I caught him between my arms, flung him into my cloak and brought him home. I was almost beside myself. Happily, the vital parts had not been wounded. I sewed up his belly in spite of his howling and yelling, for he suffered fearfully. But in three days he was already licking his wound, and a dog who licks himself is already saved. You remember that, Leverlet, eh? And aren't we fonder of each other now than ever? I was quite moved with the affection of the man for that dog, and of the dog for his master. They seemed to look into the very depths of each other's souls. The dog wagged his tail, and the man had tears in his eyes. Sperber went on. What amazing strength! Do you see, Fritz? He has burst his cord to get to me. A rope of six strands. He found out my track, and here he is. Here, Leverlet, catch! And he threw to him the remains of the leg of Kid. The jaws opened wide and closed again with a terrible crash and Sperver, looking at me significantly, said, Fritz, if he were to grip you by your breeches, you would not get away so easily. Nor anyone else, I suppose. The dog went to stretch himself at his ease, full length under the mantel-shelf, with the leg fast between his mighty paws. He began to tear it into pieces. Sperver looked at him out of the corner of his eye with great satisfaction. The bone was falling fast into small fragments in the powerful mill that was crushing it. Leverlet was partial to marrow. Aha, Fritz, if you were requested to fetch that bone away from him, what would you say? I should think it a mission requiring extraordinary delicacy and tact. Then we broke out into a hearty laugh, and Sperver, seated in his leathern easy chair, with his left arm thrown back over his head, one of his manly legs over a stool, and the other in front of a huge log which was dripping at its end with the oozing sap, and darted volumes of light grey smoke to the roof. I was still contemplating the dog when, suddenly recollecting our broken conversation, I went on. Now, Sperver, you have not told me everything. When you left the mountain for the castle, was it not on account of the death of Gertrude, your good, excellent wife? Gideon frowned and a tear dimmed his eye. He drew himself up, and shaking out the ashes of his pipe upon his thumbnail, he said, True, my wife is dead. That drove me from the woods. I could not look upon the valley of Roche Cruz without pain. I turned my flight in this direction. I hunt less in the woods, and I can see it all from higher up. And if by chance the pack trails off in that direction, I let them go. I turn back and try to think of something else. Sperver had grown taciturn. With his head drooped upon his breast, his eyes fixed on the stone floor, he sat silent. I felt sorry to have awoke these melancholy recollections in him. Then, my thoughts once more returning to the black plague groveling in the snow, I felt a shivering horror. How strange! Just one word had sent us into a train of unhappy thoughts. A whole world of remembrances was called up by a chance. I know not how long this silence lasted, when a growl, deep, long, and terrible, like distant thunder, made us start. We looked at the dog. The half-gnawed bone was still between his forepaws. 
but with head raised high ears cocked up and flashing eye he was listening intently listening to the silence as it were and an angry quivering ran down the length of his back sperver and i fixed on each other anxious eyes yet there was not a sound not a breath outside for the wind had gone down nothing could be heard but the deep protracted growl which came from deep down the chest of the noble hound suddenly he sprang up and bounded impetuously against the wall with a hoarse rough bark of fearful loudness the walls re-echoed just as if a clap of thunder had rattled the casements leverle with his head low down seemed to want to see through the granite and his lips drawn back from his teeth discovered them to the very gums displaying two close rows of fangs white as ivory still he growled for a moment he would stop abruptly with his nose snuffing close to the wall next the floor with strong respirations then he would rise again in a fresh rage and with his forepaws seemed as if he would break through the granite we watched in silence without being able to understand what caused his excitement another yell of rage more terrible than the first made us spring from our seats Liberle, what possesses you are you mad he seized a log and began to sound the wall which only returned the dead hard sound of a wall of solid rock there was no hollow in it yet the dog stood in the posture of attack decidedly you must have been dreaming bad dreams said the huntsman come lie down and don't worry us any more with your nonsense at that moment a noise outside reached our ears the door opened and the fat honest countenance of tobias offenlock with his lantern in one hand and his stick in the other his three-cornered hat on his head appeared smiling and jovial in the opening salute le honorable compagna he cried as he entered what are you doing here it was that rascal liverle who made all that row just fancy he set himself up against that wall as if he smelt a thief what could he mean why parbleu he heard the dot dot of my wooden leg to be sure stumping up the tower stairs answered the jolly fellow laughing then setting his lantern on the table that will teach you friend gideon to tie up your dogs you are foolishly weak over your dogs very foolishly those beasts of yours won't be satisfied till they have put us all out of doors just this minute i met blitzen in the long gallery he sprang at my leg see there are the marks of his teeth in proof of what i say and it is quite a new leg a brute of a hound tie up my dogs that's rather a new idea said the huntsman dogs tied up are good for nothing at all they grow too wild besides was not leverle tied up after all see his broken cord what i tell you is not on my own account when they come near me i always hold up my stick and put my wooden leg foremost that is my discipline i say dogs in their kennels cats on the roof and the people in the castle tobias sat down after thus delivering himself of his sentiments and with both elbows on the table his eyes expanding with delight he confided to us that just now he was a bachelor you don't mean that yes marie anne is sitting up with gertrude in monseigneur's ante-room then you are in no hurry to go away no none at all i should like to stay in your company how unfortunate that you should have come in so late remarked sperver all the bottles are empty the disappointment of the discomfited major-domo excited my compassion the poor man would so gladly have enjoyed his widowhood but in spite of my endeavours to repress it a long yawn extended wide my mouth well another time said he rising what is only put off is not given up and he took his lantern good night gentlemen stop wait for me cried gideon i can see fritz is sleepy we will go down together very gladly sperver on our way we will have a word with trump the butler he is downstairs with the rest and knapwurst is telling them tales all right good night fritz good night gideon 
don't forget to send for me if the count is taken worse i will do as you wish liberle come they went out and as they were crossing the platform i could hear the night at clock strike eleven i was tired out and soon fell asleep end of chapter three recording by james k white chula vista chapter four of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandra chatrian chapter four daylight was beginning to tinge with bluish gray the only window in my dungeon tower when i was roused out of my niche in the granite by the prolonged distant notes of a hunting horn there is nothing more sad and melancholy than the wail of this instrument when the day begins to struggle with the night when not a sigh nor a sound besides comes to molest the solitary reign of silence it is especially the last long note which spreads in widening waves over the immensity of the plain beneath awakening the distant far-off echoes amongst the mountains that has in it a poetic element that stirs up the depths of the soul leaning upon my elbow in my bearskin i lay listening to the plaintive sound which suggested something of the feudal ages the contemplation of my chamber the ancient den of the wolf of nidic with its low dark arch threatening almost to come down to crush the occupant and further on that small leaden window just touching the ceiling more wide than high and deeply recessed in the wall added to the reality of the impression i arose quickly and ran to open the window wide then presented itself to my astonished eyes such a wondrous spectacle as no mortal tongue no pen of man can describe the wide prospect that the eagle the denizen of the high alps sweeps with his far-reaching kin every morning at the rising of the deep purple veil that overhung the horizon by night mountains farther off mountains far away and yet again in the blue distance mountains still blending with the gray mists of the morning in the shadowy horizon motionless billows that sink into peace and stillness in the blue distance of the plains of laurent such is a faint idea of the mighty scenery of the Vuja boundless forests silver lakes dazzling crests ridges and peaks projecting their clear outlines upon the steel blue of the valleys clothed in snow beyond this infinite space could any enthusiasm of poet or skill of painter attain the sublime elevation of such a scene as that i stood mute in admiration at every moment the details stood out more clearly in the advancing light of morning hamlets farmhouses villages seemed to rise and peep out of every undulation of the land a little more attention brought more and more numerous objects into view i had leaned out of my window wrapped in contemplation for more than a quarter of an hour when a hand was laid lightly upon my shoulder i turned round startled when the calm figure and quiet smile of gideon saluted me with guten tag fritz good morning then he also rested his arms on the window smoking his short pipe he extended his hand and said look fritz and admire you are a son of the black forest and you must admire all that look there below there is roche cruz do you see it don't you remember gertrude how far off those times seem now sperver brushed away a tear what could i say we sat long contemplating and meditating over this grand spectacle from time to time the old poacher noticing me with my eyes fixed upon some distant object would explain that is the waldhorn this is the tiefenthal there's the fall of the steinbach it has stopped running now it is hanging down in great fringed sheets like the curtains over the shoulder of the harburg a cold winter's cloak 
down there is a path that leads to freeborg in a fortnight's time it will be difficult to trace it thus our time passed away i could not tear myself away from so beautiful a prospect a few birds of prey with wings hollowed into a graceful curve sharp pointed at each end the fan-shaped tail spread out were silently sweeping round the rock-hewn tower herons flew unscathed above them owing their safety from the grasp of the sharp claws and the tearing beak to the elevation of their flight not a cloud marred the beauty of the blue sky all the snow had fallen to earth once more the huntsman's horn awoke the echoes that is my friend sebalt lamenting down there said sperver he knows everything about horses and dogs and he sounds the hunter's horn better than any man in germany listen fritz how soft and mellow the notes are poor sebalt he is pining away over monseigneur's illness he cannot hunt as he used to do his only comfort is to get up every morning at sunrise on to the altenburg and play the count's favorite airs he thinks he shall be able to cure him that way sperver with the good taste of a man who appreciates beautiful scenery had offered no interruption to my contemplations but when my eyes dazzled and swimming with so much light i turned round to the darkness of the tower he said to me fritz it's all right the count has had no fresh attack these words brought me back to a sense of the realities of life ah i am very glad it is all owing to you fritz what do you mean i have not prescribed yet what signifies you were there that was enough you are only joking gideon what is the use of my being present if i don't prescribe why you bring him good luck i looked straight at him but he was not even smiling yes fritz you are just a messenger of good the last two years the lord had another attack the next day after the first then a third and a fourth you have put an end to that what can be clearer well to me it is not so very clear on the contrary it is very obscure we are never too old to learn the good man went on fritz there are messengers of evil and there are messengers of good now that rascal knapwurst he is a sure messenger of ill if ever i meet him as i am going out hunting i am sure of some misadventure my gun misses fire or i sprain my ankle or a dog gets ripped up all sorts of mischief come so being quite aware of this i always try and set off at early daybreak before that author of mischief who sleeps like a dormouse has opened his eyes or else i slip out by a back way by the postern gate don't you see i understand you very well but your ideas seem to me very strange gideon you fritz he went on without noticing my interruption you are a most excellent lad heaven has covered your head with innumerable blessings just one glance at your jolly countenance your frank clear eyes your good-natured smile is enough to make anyone happy you positively bring good luck with you i have always said so and now would you like to have a proof yes indeed i should it would be worth while to know how much there is in me without my having any knowledge of it well said he grasping my wrist look down there he pointed to a hillock at a couple of gunshots from the castle do you see there a rock half buried in the snow with a ragged bush by its side quite well do you see anything near no well there is a reason for that you have driven away the black plague every year at the second attack there she was holding her feet between her hands by night she lighted a fire she warmed herself and boiled roots she bore a curse with her this morning the very first thing which i did was to get up here i climbed up the beacon tower i looked well all round the old hag was nowhere to be seen i shaded my eyes with my hand i looked up and down right and left and everywhere 
not a sign of the creature anywhere she had scented you evidently and the good fellow in a fit of enthusiasm shook me warmly by the hand crying with unchecked emotion ah fritz how glad i am that i brought you here the witch will be sold eh well i confess i felt a little ashamed that i had been all my life such a very well-deserving young man without knowing anything of the circumstance myself so sperver i said the count has spent a good night a very good one then i am very well pleased let us go down we again traversed the high parapet and i was now better able to examine this way of access the ramparts of which arose from a prodigious depth and they were extended along the sharp narrow ridge of the rock down to the very bottom of the valley it was a long flight of jagged precipitous steps descending from the wolf's den or rather eagle's nest down to the deep valley below gazing down i felt giddy and recoiling in alarm to the middle of the platform i hastily descended down the path which led to the main building we had already traversed several great corridors when a great open door stood before us i looked in and descried at the top of a double ladder the little gnome knapwurst whose strange appearance had struck me the night before the hall itself attracted my attention by its imposing aspect it was the receptacle of the archives of the house of nidic a high dark dusty apartment with long gothic windows reaching from the angle of the ceiling to within a couple of yards from the floor there were collected along spacious shelves by the care of the old abbots not only all the documents title deeds and family genealogies of the house of nidic establishing their rights and their alliances and connections with all the great historic families of germany but besides these there were all the chronicles of the black forest the collected works of the old menesinger and great folio volumes from the presses of gutenberg and faust entitled to equal veneration on account of their remarkable history and of the enduring solidity of their binding the deep shadows of the groin vaults their arches divided by massive ribs and descending partly down the cold gray walls reminded one of the gloomy cloisters of the middle ages and amidst these characteristic surroundings sat an ugly dwarf on the top of his ladder with a red-edged volume upon his bonny knees his head half buried in a rough fur cap small gray eyes wide misshapen mouth humps on back and shoulders a most uninviting object the familiar spirit the rat as sperver would have it of this last refuge of all the learning belonging to the princely race of nidic but a truly historical importance belonged to this chamber in the long series of family portraits filling almost entirely one side of the ancient library all were there men and women from hugh the wolf to yeri hans the present owner from the first rough daub of barbarous times to the perfect work of the best modern painters my attention was naturally drawn in that direction hugh the first a bald-headed figure seemed to glare upon you like a wolf stealing upon you round the corner of a wood his gray bloodshot eyes his red beard and his large hairy ears gave him a fearful and ferocious aspect next to him like the lamb next to the wolf was the portrait of a lady of youthful years with gentle blue eyes hands crossed on the breast over a book of devotions and tresses of fair long silky hair encircling her sweet countenance with a glorious golden aureola this picture struck me by its wonderful resemblance to odile of nidic i have never seen anything more lovely and more charming than this old painting on wood which was stiff enough indeed in its outline but delightfully refreshing and ingenious i had examined this picture attentively for some minutes when another female portrait hanging at its side drew my attention reluctantly away here was a woman of the true visigoth type with a wide low forehead yellowish eyes prominent cheekbones red hair and a nose hooked like an eagle's beak that woman must have been an excellent match for hugh thought i 
and i began to consider the costume which answered perfectly to the energy displayed in the head for the right hand rested upon a sword and an iron breastplate enclosed the figure i should have some difficulty in expressing the thoughts which passed through my mind in the examination of these three portraits my eye passed from the one to the other with singular curiosity sperver standing at the library door had aroused the attention of knapwurst with a sharp whistle which made that worthy send a glance in his direction though it did not succeed in fetching him down from his elevation is it me that you're whistling to like a dog said the dwarf i am you vermin it is an honor you don't deserve just listen to me sperver replied the little man with sublime scorn you cannot spit so high as my shoe which he contemptuously held out suppose i were to come up if you come up a single step i'll squash you flat with this volume gideon laughed and replied don't get angry friend i don't mean to do you any harm on the contrary i greatly respect you for your learning but what i want to know is what you were doing here so early in the morning by lamplight you look as if you had spent the night here so i have i have been reading all night are not the days long enough for you to read in no i am following out an important inquiry and i don't mean to sleep until i am satisfied indeed and what may this very important question be i have to ascertain under what circumstances ludwig of nideck discovered my ancestor otto the dwarf in the forests of thuringia you know sperver that my ancestor otto was only a cubit high that is a foot and a half he delighted the world with his wisdom and made an honorable figure at the coronation of duke rudolph count ludwig had him enclosed in a cold roast peacock served up in all his plumage it was at that time one of the greatest delicacies served up garnished all round with suckling pigs gilded and silvered during the banquet otto kept spreading the peacock's tail and all the lords courtiers and ladies of high birth were astonished and delighted at this wonderful piece of mechanism at last he came out sword in hand and shouted with a loud voice long live duke rudolph and the cry was repeated with acclamations by the whole table bernard herzog makes mention of this event but he has neglected to inform us where this dwarf came from whether he was of lofty lineage or of base extraction which latter however is very improbable for the lower sort of people have not so much sense as that i was astounded at so much pride in so diminutive a being yet my curiosity prevented me from showing too much of my feelings for he alone could supply me with information upon the portraits that accompanied that of hugh lupus monsieur knapwurst i began very respectfully would you oblige me by enlightening me upon certain historic doubts speak sir without any constraint on the subject of family history and chronicles i am entirely at your service other matters don't interest me i desire to learn some particulars respecting the two portraits on each side of the founder of this race aha uh -huh, cried knapwurst with a glow of satisfaction lighting up his hideous features you mean hedviga and huldina the two wives of hugh lupus and laying down his volume he descended from his ladder to speak more at his ease his eyes glistened and the delight of gratified vanity beamed from them as he displayed his vast erudition when he had arrived at my side he bowed to me with ceremonious gravity sperver stood behind us very well satisfied that i was admiring the dwarf of nideck in spite of the ill luck which in his opinion accompanied the little monster's appearance he respected and boasted of his superior knowledge sir said knapwurst pointing with his yellow hand to the portraits hugh of nideck the first of his illustrious race married in 832 hedviga of lutzelborg who brought to him in dowry the counties of Germany and haute bar the castles of geraldsek teufelshorn and others hugh lupus had no issue by his first wife who died young in the year of our lord 837 then hugh having become lord and owner of the dowry refused to give it up 
and there were terrible battles between himself and his brothers-in-law but his second wife huldina whom you see there in a steel breastplate aided him by her sage counsel it is unknown whence or of what family she came but for all that she saved hugh's life who had been made prisoner by franz of lutzelburg he was to have been hanged that very day and a gibbet had already been set up on the ramparts when huldina at the head of her husband's vassals whom she had armed and inspired with her own courage bravely broke in released hugh and hung franz in his place hugh had married his wife in eight forty two and had three children by her so i resumed pensively the first of these wives was called hedviga and the descendants of nidic are not related to her not at all are you quite sure i can show you our genealogical tree hedviga had no children huldina the second wife had three that is surprising to me why so i thought i traced a resemblance ha <laughs> ha resemblance rubbish cried knapwurst with a discordant laugh see look at this wooden snuff-box in it you see a portrait of my great-grandfather hansvurst his nose is as long and as pointed as an extinguisher and his jaws like nutcrackers how does that affect his being the grandfather of me of a man with finely formed features and an agreeable mouth oh no of course not well so it is with the nidics they may some of them be like hedviga but for all that huldina is the head of their ancestry see the genealogical tree now sir are you satisfied then we separated knapwurst and i excellent friends end of chapter four recording by james k white chula vista chapter five of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandra chatrian chapter five nevertheless thought i there is the likeness it is not chance what is chance there is no such thing it is nonsense to talk of chance it must be something higher i was following my friend sperver deep in thought who had now resumed his walk down the corridor the portrait of hedviga in all its artless simplicity mingled in my mind with the face of odile suddenly gideon stopped and raising my eyes i saw that we were standing before the count's door come in fritz he said and i will give the dogs a feed when the master is away the servants neglect their duty i will come for you by and by i entered more desirous of seeing the young lady than the count her father i was blaming myself for my remissness but there is no controlling one's interest in affections i was much surprised to see in the half-light of the alcove the reclining figure of the count leaning upon his elbow and observing me with profound attention i was so little prepared for this examination that i stood rather dispossessed of self-command come nearer monsieur le docteur he said in a weak but firm voice holding out his hand my faithful sperber has often mentioned your name to me and i was anxious to make your acquaintance let us hope my lord that it will be continued under more favourable circumstances a little patience and we shall avert this attack i think not he replied i feel my time drawing near you are mistaken my lord no nature grants us as a last favour to have a presentiment of our approaching end how often i have seen such presentiments falsified i said with a smile he fixed his eyes searchingly upon me as is usual with patients expressing anxiety about their prospects it is a difficult moment for the doctor the moral strength of his patient 
depends upon the expression of the firmness of his convictions the eye of the sufferer penetrates into the innermost soul of his consciousness if he believes that he can discover any hint or shade of doubt his fate is sealed depression sets in the secret springs that maintain the elasticity of the spirit give way and the disorder has it all its own way i stood my examination firmly and successfully and the count seemed to regain confidence he again pressed my hand and resigned himself calmly and confidently to my treatment not until then did i perceive mademoiselle odile and an old lady no doubt her governess seated by her bedside at the other end of the alcove they silently saluted me and suddenly the picture in the library reappeared before me it is she i said hugh's first wife there is the fair and noble brow there are the long lashes and that sad unfathomable smile oh how much past telling lies in a woman's smile seek not then for unmixed joy and pleasure her smile serves but to veil untold sorrows anxiety for the future even heart-rending cares the maid the wife the mother smile and smile even when the heart is breaking and the abyss is opening o oh, woman this is thy part in the mortal struggle of human life i was pursuing these reflections when the lord of nidic began to speak if my dear child odile would but consult my wishes i believe my health would return i looked towards the young countess she fixed her eyes on the floor and seemed to be praying silently yes the sick man went on i should then return to life the prospect of seeing myself surrounded by a young family and of pressing grandchildren to my heart and beholding the succession to my house would revive me at the mild and gentle tone of entreaty in which this was said i felt deeply moved with compassion but the young lady made no reply in a minute or two the count who kept his watchful eyes upon her went on odile you refuse to make your father a happy man i only ask for a faint hope i fix no time i won't limit your choice we will go to court there you will have a hundred opportunities of marrying with distinction and with honor who would not be proud to win my daughter's hand you shall be perfectly free to decide for yourself he paused there is nothing more painful to a stranger than these family quarrels there are such contending interests so many private motives at work that mere modesty should make it our duty to place ourselves out of hearing of such discussions i felt pained and would gladly have retired but the circumstances of the case forbade this my dear father said odile as if to evade any further discussion you will get better heaven will not take you from those who love you if you but knew the fervor with which i pray for you that is not an answer said the count dryly what objection can you make to my proposal is it not fair and natural am i to be deprived of the consolations vouchsafed to the neediest and most wretched you know i have acted towards you openly and frankly you have my father then give me your reason for your refusal my resolution is formed i have consecrated myself to god so much firmness in so frail a being made me tremble she stood like the sculptured madonna in hugh's tower calm and immovable however weak in appearance the eyes of the count kindled with ominous fire i tried to make the young countess understand by signs how gladly i would hear her give the least hope and calm his rising passion but she seemed not to see me so he cried in a smothered tone as if he were strangling so you will look on and see your father perish a word would restore him to life and you refuse to speak that one word 
life is not in the hand of man for it is god's gift my word can be of no avail those are nothing but pious maxims answered the count scornfully to release you from your plain duty but has not god said honor thy father and thy mother i do honor you she replied gently but it is my duty not to marry i could hear the grinding and gnashing of the man's teeth he lay apparently calm but presently turned abruptly and cried leave me the sight of you is offensive to me and addressing me as i stood by agitated with conflicting feelings doctor he cried with a savage grin have you any violent malignant poison about you to give me something that will destroy me like a thunderbolt it would be a mercy to poison me like a dog rather than let me suffer as i am doing his features writhed convulsively his color became livid odile rose and advanced to the door stay he howled furiously stay till i have cursed you so far i had stood by without speaking not venturing to interfere between father and daughter but now i could refrain no longer monseigneur i cried for the sake of your own health for the sake of mere justice and fairness do calm yourself your life is at stake what matters my life what matters the future is there a knife here to put an end to me let me die his excitement rose every minute i seemed to dread lest in some frenzied moment he should spring from the bed and destroy his child's life but she calm though deadly pale knelt at the door which was standing open and outside i could see sperver whose features betrayed the deepest anxiety he drew near without noise and bending towards odile oh mademoiselle he whispered mademoiselle the count is such a worthy good man if you would but just say only perhaps by and by we will see she made no reply and did not change her attitude at this moment i persuaded the lord of nidic to take a few drops of laudanum he sank back with a sigh and soon his panting and irregular breathing became more measured under the influence of a deep and heavy slumber odile arose and her aged friend who had not opened her lips went out with her sperver and i watched their slowly retreating figures there was a calm grandeur in the step of the young countess which seemed to express a consciousness of duty fulfilled when she had disappeared down the long corridor gideon turned towards me well fritz he said gravely what is your opinion i bent my head down without answering this girl's incredible firmness astonished and bewildered me end of chapter five recording by james k white chula vista chapter six of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandra chatrian chapter six sperver's indignation was mounting there's the happiness and felicity of the rich what is the good of being master of nidic with castles forests lakes and all the best parts of the black forest when an innocent-looking damsel comes and says to you in her sweet soft voice is that your will well it is not mine do you say i must well i say no i won't is it not awful would it not be better to be a woodcutter's son and live quietly upon the wages of your day's work come on fritz let us be off i am suffocating here i want to get into the open air and the good fellow seizing my arm dragged me down the corridor it was now about nine the sky had been fair when we got up but now the clouds had again covered the dreary earth the north wind was raising the snow in ghostly eddies against the window panes and i could scarcely distinguish the summits of the neighboring mountains 
we were going down the stairs which led into the hall when at a turn in the corridor we found ourselves face to face with tobias offenlock the worthy major-domo in a great state of palpitation hello he cried closing our way with his stick right across the passage where are you off to in such a hurry what about our breakfast breakfast which breakfast do you mean asked sperver what do you mean by pretending to forget what breakfast are not you and i to breakfast this morning with dr fritz aha uh -huh, so we are i had forgotten all about it and offenlock burst into a great laugh which divided his jolly face from ear to ear ha <laughs> ha this is rather beyond a joke and i was afraid of being too late come let us be moving casper is upstairs waiting i ordered him to lay the breakfast in your room i thought we should be more comfortable there good-bye for the present doctor are you not coming up with us asked sperver no i'm going to tell the countess that the baron de zimmer bluderich begs the honor to thank her in person before he leaves the castle the baron de zimmer yes that stranger who came yesterday in the middle of the night well you must make haste yes i shall not be long before you have done uncorking the bottles i shall be with you again and he hobbled away as fast as he could the mention of breakfast had given a different turn to sperver's thoughts exactly so he observed turning back the best way to drown all your cares is to drink a draught of good wine i am very glad we are going to breakfast in my room under those great high vaults in the fencing school sitting round a small table you feel just like mice nibbling a nut in a corner of a big church here we are fritz just listen to the wind whistling through the arrow slits in half an hour there will be a storm he pushed the door open and casper who was only drumming with his fingers upon the window panes seemed very glad to see us that little man had flaxen hair and a snub nose sperver had made him his factotum it was he who took to pieces and cleaned his guns mended the riding horse's harness fed the dogs in his absence and superintended in the kitchen the preparation of his favorite dishes on grand occasions he was outrider he now stood with a napkin over his arm and was gravely uncorking the long-necked bottle of rhenish casper said his master as soon as he had surveyed this satisfactory state of things casper i was very well pleased with you yesterday everything was excellent the roast kid the chicken and the fish i like fair play and when a man has done his duty i like to tell him so today i am quite as well satisfied the boar's head looks excellent with its white wine sauce so does the crayfish soup isn't it your opinion too fritz i assented well said sperver since it is so you shall have the honor of filling our glasses i mean to raise you step by step for you are a very deserving fellow casper looked down bashfully and blushed he seemed to enjoy his master's praises we took our places and i was wondering at this quondam poacher who in years gone by was content to cook his own potatoes in his cottage now assuming all the airs of a great seigneur had he been born lord of nidick he could not have put on a more noble and dignified attitude at table a single glance brought casper to his side made him bring such and such a bottle or bring the dish he required we were just going to attack the boar's head when master tobias appeared in person followed by no less a personage than the baron of zimmer bluderich attended by his groom we rose from our seats the young baron advanced to meet us with head uncovered it was a noble-looking head pale and haughty with a surrounding of fine dark hair he stopped before sperver monsieur said he in that pure saxon accent which no other dialect can approach i am come to ask you for information as to this locality madame la comtesse de nidic tells me that no one knows these mountains so well as yourself that is quite true monseigneur and i am quite at your service circumstances of great urgency oblige me to start in the midst of the storm replied the baron pointing to the window panes thickly covered with flakes of snow i must reach waldhorn six leagues from this place 
that will be a hard matter my lord for all the roads are blocked up with snow i am aware of that but necessity obliges you must have a guide then i will go if you will allow me to subalt craft the head huntsman at nidick he knows the mountains almost as well as i do i am much obliged to you for your kind offers and i am very grateful but still i cannot accept them your instructions will be quite sufficient sperver bowed then advancing to a window he opened it wide a furious blast of wind rushed in driving the whirling snow as far as the corridor and slammed the door with a crash i remained by my chair leaning on its back casper slunk into a corner sperver and the baron with his groom stood at the open window gentlemen said sperver with a loud voice to make himself heard above the howling winds and with arm extended you see the country mapped out before you if the weather was fair i would take you up into the tower and then we could see the whole of the black forest at our feet but it is no use now here you can see the peak of the altenberg farther on behind that white ridge you may see the waldhorn beaten by a furious storm you must make straight for the waldhorn from the summit of the rock which seems formed like a mitre and is called roche you will see three peaks the Berenkop, the gerestein and the trifles it is by this last one at the right that you must proceed there is a torrent across the valley of the rathal but it must be frozen now in any case if you can get no farther you will find on your left on following the bank a cavern halfway up the hill called roche cruz you can spend the night there and tomorrow very likely if the wind falls you will see the waldhorn before you if you are lucky enough to meet with a charcoal burner he might perhaps show you where there is a ford over the stream but i doubt whether one will be found anywhere on such a day as this there are none from our neighborhood only be careful to go right round the base of the Berenkop, for you could not get down the other side it is a precipice during these observations i was watching sperver whose clear energetic tones indicated the different points in the road with the greatest precision and i watched too the young baron who was listening with the closest attention no obstacle seemed to alarm him the old groom seemed not less bent upon the enterprise just as they were leaving the window a momentary light broke through the gray snow clouds just one of those moments when the eddying wind lays hold of the falling clouds of snow and flings them back again like floating garments of white then for a moment there was a glimpse of the distance the three peaks stood out behind the altenberg the description which sperver had given of invisible objects became visible for a few moments then the air again was veiled in ghostly clouds of flying snow thank you said the baron now i have seen the point i am to make for and thanks to your explanations i hope to reach it sperver bowed without answering the young man and his servant having saluted us retired slowly and gravely gideon shut the window and addressing master tobias and me said the deuce must be in the man to start off in such horrible weather as this i could hardly turn out a wolf on such a day as this however it is their business not mine i seem to remember that young man's face and his servants too now let us drink mater toby your health i had gone to the window and as the baron zimmer and his groom mounted on horseback in the middle of the courtyard in spite of the snow which was filling the air i saw at the left in a turret pierced with long gothic windows the pale countenance of odile directed long and anxiously towards the young man hello fritz what are you doing i'm only looking at those strangers horses oh the wallachians i saw them this morning in the stable they are splendid animals the horseman galloped away at full speed and the curtain in the turret window dropped End of chapter 6 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista